Good morning and welcome to this panel on activism at a crossroads at the third annual Bay Area Book Festival. My name is Jesse Edegeen. I'm proud to be the mayor of the city of Berkeley. And before I introduce Monica, um, I want to just talk about the book festival. I remember it was four years ago, Sherilyn Parsons came to me. Okay. And, um, and said, I had this idea about having a book festival in Berkeley. I mean, Berkeley is the center of, of intellectual exchange, and we have the University of California, and shouldn't we have a book festival? And now, three years later, for, we have a, we have a, we've had three book festivals in the city of Berkeley. I want to thank you so much for being here today. Um, for, for those of you that are not from Berkeley, um, thank you for attending, and we hope that you stay around to discover the amazing businesses that Berkeley has to offer. And we're all familiar with Berkeley's long history of intellectual discourse and political activism. It's part of what makes Berkeley, Berkeley. Um, but the new federal administration that defies logic and common sense, um, there's a growing urgency to resist in which Berkeley has been a leader in. We are a leader in the resistance. And so over the next hour, you'll be hearing from a couple of authors who have been deeply involved in protests and in progressive values. And before we get to the main discussion, I want to introduce the moderator for this session, Monica Barlin. Monica is the CEO of Mother Jones, a reader-supported, award-winning nonprofit news organization. They do independent and investigative reporting on everything from politics to climate change, to education, to food. Uh, some of the uh, 11 million people, uh, 11 million people visit their website each month, and they also publish a bi-monthly uh, 200,000 circulation magazine, which I am a subscriber to. And we can say that for 40 years, Mother Jones's investigations have truly changed the world, breaking news and revealing information that has changed political campaigns, caused new laws to be passed, and mobilized millions of people. And so there's no better person to moderate this book session, book festival session on activism at this critical time than Monica, who will introduce our two speakers. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you so much, Mayor Aragin. Um, and thank you, Berkeley, um, for having us. And thank you, Freight and Salvage, for this amazing space. Um, I'm also supposed to thank our sponsors, um, Mother Jones. Thank you, Mother Jones. You're welcome, Monica. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, most of all, all of you who have taken time out of your Saturday and your, you know, hiking and barbecuing um, to be here. Um, and rallies, naturally. Well, the rallies are tomorrow. Um, you know, we, we have rallies every Sunday. Um, I am so thrilled and honored to be here um, with these two people who are um, super smart, super effective, and um, really deep thinkers about um, activism and organizing and changing the world at a moment when that feels like the most urgent thing we could be thinking about. Um, and I'm not going to say a lot about them because I think um, their work will come out over the course of the conversation and we also want to leave some time at the end for your questions. Um, so just super briefly, Becky Bond, um, really the, the only thing we need to say about her is that she is one of the reasons why Bernie Sanders almost won. Um, and that was a, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that because that was sort of a political miracle that, you know, Sanders got as far as he did. And it didn't just happen out of nowhere. There was a lot um, behind that, um, behind the scenes, you know, some of you, I'm sure, were part of it, but even when you're part of it, it's hard to see the big picture of all the work that goes into it. And in this particular case, I think the work that went into that is something that um, we can learn a lot from. Um, and Micah White um, is one of the reasons why the Occupy movement transformed the political landscape um, six years ago now. <laughs> um, Micah came up with the idea and instigated um, a lot of the energy that went into that and has, is also just an incredibly deep and brilliant thinker about the history um, and theory of revolution. Um, 
And so he's, he's moving on from um, the paradigm of activism of the past and thinking about what's next in um, making change in the world. And we'll talk about that a lot. Um, but because this is all really 10,000 feet in the air, I wanted to you know, get really personal and intimate um, for a minute and just see if this, this moment right now that we're living in is a moment when a lot of people are looking around and saying, okay, democracy is not on automatic pilot. The kind of change that I wanna see is not gonna happen by itself. I am going to get my friends together and do something. Literally almost everybody that I talk to is having that kind of moment. And I wanna take you back to when you first had that feeling. Um, how old were you? What were you doing? And what, what did you do? Maybe start with Micah. Um, yeah, I mean, so I've been an activist my entire life. <clears throat> I actually started doing activism when I was 13 years old. So people will say, ask me, like, why, why, you know? And I think that on the one hand, I mean, biographical explanation is that I am biracial. My dad is black and my mom is white. And something that we don't talk about in America is that it wasn't until like the late 60s that the Supreme Court ruled that black people and white people could get married in every single state. It's a kind of crazy, um, I don't know if you didn't know about that, dig into that. It's crazy that, that in some states in this country it was illegal. So, so I think of myself kind of as the first, uh, you know, one of the first generations of, of love child of that. But I also think there's something else, which is that um, I've always had a passion for it. I remember my dad went to San Francisco when I was a kid and he said, what do you want? And I was like, get me a history book about the theory of activism, you know, what activism they were doing. <laughs> and I was like, why do you care about that? You're 13 years old. So it's like asking a painter, why, why do you paint? It's just this intuitive thing. And I was, I was very good at it, very young age, so it's always been there with me. Well, and by the way, let me show you Micah's book because he'll be signing it later, um, right in the lobby. Um, so get your, um, sharpen your pencils and get your uh, inscriptions ready. Well, I, I wasn't nearly as precocious as, uh, as Micah. And I think I had an experience that like a lot of people may have had after the election of Trump, maybe not so much in Berkeley, but uh, in, after, in the run up to the invasion of Iraq um, in 2002, 2003, I was actually running a radio show on a local NPR affiliate called uh, KALW out of San Francisco. <laughs> Mighty K-A-L-W, and, um, and it was a current affairs show um, where we were talking about what was going on in, in the world. And, and as it became clear um, after we bombed Afghanistan that we were going to invade Iraq, um, I really started to think about, is it enough really to be talking about these issues and to be knowing what's going on, or do we really need to do something about it? And my boss at the time, who was a co-founder of Working Assets, um, decided that, that we at Working Assets needed to, to organize a big anti-war protest and I had never organized something like that before. And he made me be in charge of it. Um, and um, because I was the radio producer, so I, would, I produced things. And so he had me produce this, um, this anti-war protest, which was um, uh, at, at, in front of Grace Cathedral. It was environmentalists against the war. Um, and we had a parade of electric vehicles and biodiesel vehicles and walkers um, against the war uh, as environmentalists. And, and 5,000 people showed up. Um, and, uh, and I've been involved in organizing ever since that moment. Mike, I kind of follow up to that. Um, when you were 13, like what was one of the things that you did? <laughs> well, I mean, I think I, oh boy, you want to know the very first protest that I did was that I refused to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance um, in eighth grade. <laughs> which, at, you know, when you're young like that, it's like people say, well, why did you do that? And, and you always have these reasons, but the reasons are never as good as you wish they were when you're older. So, I mean, the reason was like poorly defined something about how the words didn't reflect the reality you know, the liberty and justice for all didn't reflect the reality of America. And I was kicked off the eighth grade field trip. But then every year after that, I would do something else. So I did a student newspaper in ninth grade and everything. Every year after that, I did something. And by the time I was 17, though, those campaigns started to get national attention. So I was on Bill Maher's Politically Correct when I was 17 for starting an atheist club in my high school. So basically, like, my entire life has been activism, and that's all I've ever done. And so, and then 28, I was Occupy Wall Street. So it's, it's weird. It's been a weird kind of journey through protest, yeah. And we'll talk a little bit in a minute about um, what you're doing now, um, which is a, yet another um, experiment and different incarnation. Um, I wanted Becky to, um, so Becky's book um, is written with Zach Exley, um, and she will also be signing it after. Um, it's a skinnier book than Micah's. Um, 
<laughs> but equally packed with information. And there's a sentence that jumped out at me. I think it's actually one of Zach's chapters, but I'm going to um, put you on the hot seat for it anyway. Um, where he says, um, it, the book is really elegantly hedged because it came out before the election. And you know, so they account for the fact that they don't know what the outcome is going to be. But it basically, there's a, there's a passage where Zach says, well, increasingly sophisticated versions of Trump are going to run, and eventually one will win. And you read that now, it gives you pause. And I'm wondering um, what you guys learned on the Bernie campaign um, that made you think that a Trump-like candidate might win, but that also made you think that he wouldn't. Well, that's a great question. I mean, Zach and I wrote the book. Um, we holed up in a cabin in, um, in the San Geronimo Valley for five weeks. Uh, for the month of August and the, the first week of September before the election because we'd learned so many things on the campaign trail working with volunteers and volunteers had built these amazing tactics on the ground and we wanted to be sure to get it out there and share what we had learned um, because we thought we would need to be holding a President Clinton accountable, right? And that we felt like we needed to hold her accountable for all the things that we had pushed her to say on the campaign trail. Um, as, the, uh, as the people that were fighting to elect Bernie in the primary. And, and, but we did have had the experience on the campaign trail of understanding how angry people were because we traveled around the country and we talked to voters um, every day. And we talked to volunteers who were talking to voters uh, every day. And so we really knew that when we, t that we were talking to voters in, the, in places like Iowa and, and Oklahoma and in places um, uh, like Arkansas and Texas where they were saying things like, you know, the, the Democrats say the economy is, is great and has, has recovered, but everyone I know is doing worse. And they would say things like, yes, Obamacare helped my friend who had a pre-existing condition, but I'm forced to pay for health care and the deductible is so high, I still can't go to the doctor. So we knew at a very basic level that Democrats weren't fixing the problems um, that were really forcing people to struggle on a daily basis and have been struggling for years and that they were looking for change and for an alternative. And, and I think when we wrote the introduction, again, it was, in, um, it was at the end of August, you know, we really felt like it was up in the air. And I think what one of the things that Zach wrote was we don't know if we just missed a very close brush with fascism or if we are going to have learned that, yes, it can happen here too. And, um, and I think that's... And I think that's what we learned, that if the Democrats or if progressives don't put up an alternative that addresses the real problems that people are struggling with in their lives, um, then they're going to vote for people that are going to suggest change, and that change might be fascist change. We'd like to see it be, you know, democratic, you know, socialist change. Um, but there, there needs to be change, right? So, so I think that really more reflected, like, less of a faith in Democrats to actually embrace populism and racial justice um, than it was some um, faith in the sophistication of, of Trump and those who will run like him. Uh, coming right up. Um, so Becky's book is called Rules for Revolutionaries, How Big Organizing Can Change Everything. And uh, we'll get to Micah's title because I have a question having to do with it. And I wanted to sort of counter the downer of um, what you just said. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. Because we have to face, you know, we sort of have to face the reality um, of a really complex situation. Um, but the word big organizing in this title is um, the hopeful part, is that you guys felt like on this campaign you discovered something um, that was very different from the kind of organizing that um, you had seen before. Um, and so, um, so that those of you in the audience who haven't read the book can pretend they read the book, um, would you tell us what um, you know, how you describe big organizing and what that looks like. Yeah, sure. So, so one of the things, it, it's really more that we tapped into something that was going on and, and helped it be more strategic and applied to, to, to winning a fight that needed to be won. It wasn't that we discovered something, it's that we, we joined a movement moment and we turned it towards an election. And, and one of the things that we really learned on the campaign trail was that, you know, people were just waiting to be asked to do something big if they could win something big and that people were increasingly less willing to do small things to win small things. And I think politicians have seen people be less willing to do small things as proof of the, their apathy, but really it's because people believe doing the small thing, it's not really gonna change things to win the small thing, and, and they realize that they, that why bother? And so, um, so what big organizing is, it's, it's really, it's a return to the mass participation kind of politics 
in which social movements that have been successful have all had an element of. Um, but what was different about big organizing in this moment is, is the moment that we're in. We have so many things that we didn't have 10 years ago or 20 years ago that makes it easier for this to be um, driven from the ground up rather from the top down. And, and so by big organizing, we mean um, you have to be going for something big that's motivating and inspiring people to actually get involved. You have to allow people to, to participate in a big way, not just stuffing envelopes or holding a sign, but actually being able to run things. Um, and it has to be big in that the tactics are about mass participation, about getting everybody involved. And so the idea of not trying to win an election with the thinnest, minor with the thinnest majority possible by going for the swing vote, but to try and build a real and enduring majority by getting everybody to our side. Uh, and to push for things, um, you know, that will really that will really change things. And so we think that big organizing used at a local or national level makes a lot of things possible that we didn't think were possible before. And so it opens up, it does open up a lot of hope um, for what we can accomplish as we move forward. Thank you. Um, Micah's book is called The End of Protest, A Playbook for a Revolution. And... Um, I read that title as encapsulating, um, as, as referring to Occupy in part, as you know, the, in, in the book, Occupy emerges in a way almost like the last protest. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that experience and why it led you to um, a paradigm shift? Yeah, well I think the core message that I'm trying to get across to activists is that for a very long time, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, we've been chasing a certain story of protests. And that story is something like, if you can get large numbers of people into the streets, largely nonviolent, largely unified behind a central message, then change will have to happen. And we don't really, un we don't usually examine why we tell that story, but I'm starting to understand that has something to do with this kind of concepts of democracy and sovereignty and this idea that we can manifest a sovereignty higher than our governments if we get together collectively in the streets. And what I'm trying to get across to people with my book is to say, look, we did that with Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street was probably the best realization of that story of protest, and it didn't work. So I call Occupy Wall Street a basically a constructive failure. It failed to get the change that we wanted, but in failing, it did something very constructive and very positive, which is it, it released us from having to do it again. You know, and which is, no, which is really great. Which is really great, because I think that when a lot of people went from Occupy Wall Street and they just channeled right into Black Lives Matter, and they did the exact same things again. They said, they, it's, like they, it's like they thought Occupy failed because we weren't disruptive enough, no. Occupy failed because the underlying theory of change is broken. And so when I, when I say the end of protest, a lot of people will say to me, but look, there's protests all the time. And, and what I want to try to say is, look, the end of protest is not the absence of protest, it's the proliferation of ineffective protest. We live in a time of the increasing size and frequency of protests and their increasing, increasing ineffectiveness. And we will see Unless we, unless we shift the way we do it, we will see this trend continue, you know? So it's, it's very important. Let me put it this way. A lot of activists in America and the Western countries pretend like we live in a country like China. China spends a lot of money preventing people from going into the streets and protesting. That's not true. Our country loves ineffective protest. It's the, <laughs> they do. It's the best legitimating, it, it legitimates democracy. And if, and if Trump is able to, um, you know, basically tolerate them and wave to them, it keeps him in power. So I, I think it's very important for us to kind of um, challenge our assumptions about what creates change through protest. So um, give us an example of that, because in the book, you know, you really, I mean, this is, um, this is a pretty deep and challenging book, and you look at, you know, the history and philosophy of protest um, in a way that not very many people have. But just to make it really practical, um, when you look back over the arc of history, pull out an example of something that is not that kind of ineffectual protest. Mm. Well, you know, one of the elements of my book is a kind of, I, I lay out basically a theory of social change. There's four different options. And, and, and basically, let's, let's put it this way, is that almost all activism today falls under this, this paradigm called voluntarism. And the idea behind voluntarism is if you want change, then you have to get humans to do collective behaviors in the natural world. So, I mean, another example that I'm going to go to the complete opposite extreme and give you a crazy example here. And this is the idea that revolution and is actually a kind of a process of divine intervention into our lives. And so I'm going to give you an example. This is a little bit, people say, oh, that's impossible. But let me give you an example. There was this, this, this Russian cosmologist in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the early 20th century, and he studied, studied sunspot activity. And he actually, I don't know if you know this, but the sun 
every 11 years goes through this cycle where there's greater and fewer numbers of sunspots. And he discovered that revolutions tend to occur during periods of peak sunspot activity. <laughs> now this sounds completely insane until you go back and look at the sun on the first day of Occupy Wall Street, which I have done, and turns out it was erupting in sunspots. <laughs> so I think what I'm trying to say is that there are other possibilities for what actually creates these eruptions of social, mo social movements. <laughs> And, and as activists, that liberates us. It liberates us because we don't have to like beg our friends to go to a protest if it's actually something like food prices or sunspot activity or other things, you know, that, that pulls it out. So, yeah. So when, uh, when the sunspots or, you know, um, I, I think, well, backing up a little bit, what you just did um, was a thing that I think we see a lot in, and I don't want to go all like Silicon Valley and disrupt, but that we see a lot in the, um, th that is one of the positive aspects of the tech economy is just saying, okay, let's do something a little different because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the things that, you know, the tech economy builds have, have not existed before, so why not do it, you know, why not make the phone have the internet on it? <laughs> um, and there's a, there's a thing that both of you describe in your books that has to do with um, iterative innovation and just trying some stuff instead of thinking what shall we do and having a you know really complex um, plan that you execute step by step just throwing some spaghetti on the wall at the wall and looking at what's working and then doing that thing again um, I'm curious if you can describe how that works and why you gravitated in that direction hmm that's a, that's a good question I mean I think that the thing about it is, one way, of, one way of kind of conceiving of it is to understand that revolution is a very interesting phenomenon. It has a few interesting characteristics about it. First of all, it's one of the most complex phenomena that we have in, in, human, phenomena, in human society. It is something that often comes as a surprise to participants. It is, it's something that has always happened throughout hi human history. We actually have records that from ancient Egypt of the first revolution that someone wrote down. Oh, there are poor people overthrowing the king. And so once you realize that, you start to understand that the behaviors that we do during protests are arbitrary and historically defined. So right now, a lot of us like they just had a march for truth. So marching is big right now. But if we had been alive during the American Revolution, we'd be tarring and feathering people or pulling down their houses. There's like, it's, it's arbitrary. So we're able, if once you understand that, then you're able to say, oh, we can ask people to do any behavior. We can create a social movement that does any behavior, hopping up and down the streets, running for elections, doing this, doing that. And so it's a question of figuring out, well, what would be the behavior that would be the most effective in this particular moment? And I think that that's where you get the innovative thing, is that you, you're allow, you allow yourself to just be liberated from the repertoire of protests that we're so familiar with. I mean, I like to tell people, never protest the same way twice. Like, once we have a march or once we occupy, just don't do it again. It, it, it's, 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 I think, very important. So tell us a story from the campaign trail, Becky, of, you know, where there, there, there were a lot of moments when that happened, when you just sort of had to do a thing differently because you didn't have the option of doing it the way it had been done. Yeah, I mean, we, so, so we suspected when we were, you know, we were taking this candidate from, you know, uh, or his, his, his policy platform was taking him, you know, and uh, from 3% name recognition to, in the end, winning 46% of the delegates of the Democratic National Convention, that we, we knew that what we had to do was be big in order to, in order to win, right? And so we, we knew that our problem was one of scale, what, and, and we knew that we had to do things differently if we were gonna take this candidate, you know, to where we needed to be and win. And, and I think we had the inklings of this idea that if we did anything like it had been done before, we just never would get there because we hadn't seen an example, right, of someone like Bernie winning the nomination. So we knew we had to do things differently. And I think now that we've seen Trump get elected, we know that if we do anything that looks like the electoral or the protest politics that happened before November of 2016, we're gonna just stay in the same place, right? So I think the need to do something radically different is just proven by what we were doing before got us to where we are now, which is uh, deep in, in, in the bottom of a, of a hole. So a, a good example um, on, our, on our campaign was that, you know, we were on the digital team, um, and I was on this, was part of this sort of this outpost on the fringe of the Bernie Sanders campaign, which turned out to be huge because a lot of you all started doing amazing work in California when the election was actually happening in Iowa and in New Hampshire. Um, and, so, and so we knew we had to get as many people as possible plugged into to working for Bernie, and so we were using, we were digital people, we were using email, we were using the web to try and like take all these people that were organizing bands and writing, like writing music and making software to do voter contact, right? And so we thought, well, let's send them email and tell them what they need to do is get on the phone and call Iowa, 
because that's where the election is happening. And we thought this is going to be great. Everybody's putting all, raising all this money, doing all this work. And so we emailed people saying, would you phone bank? And basically, no one did it. <laughs> no one. I mean, hardly anyone, right? And so we're like, oh, we need some people to host phone banks, and then people will show up at the phone bank, so let's, let's see how we can get people to host phone banks. And, and Zach Hexley, who I worked with, had this crazy idea. He's like, the digital team should travel places and have in-person meetings where we'll convince people to host phone banks and host canvases, and then we'll just fly around the country holding giant in-person meetings, um, and then we'll just get them started, and then after that, we'll just talk to them by email and on conference calls and those sort of things. And I thought that was the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. Like, that we're the digital team and we're really going to fly around the country meeting people in person. We're supposed to be using the internet to get people to do stuff by remote control. And so, but I knew my friend Zach and I knew that he would not shut up about it <laughs> if I didn't show that this was a stupid idea that wasn't going to work. And so I said, okay, let's really quickly do one of these things so we can take it off the table. <laughs> and so, and so, so, we, so we went to, you know, went to Memphis, Tennessee and Nashville, Tennessee, and Johnson City, Tennessee, to do these organizing meetings, right? And as it turns out, everywhere we had a meeting and said some random staffer from the Bernie Sanders campaign is going to come and tell you how the, you can get to work to let Bernie win, and like hundreds of people showed up at these meetings. And then we would get them to commit to hold events, and then, and then they would hold them not just once, but they'd hold them every week, sometimes three times a week. And so the vast majority of the 100,000 volunteer-led phone banks that were led for um, Bernie Sanders were actually led by people that got started at one of these in-person meetings across the, across the country. We had a thousand of these rallies across the country. And the first 350 were led by digital staffers on the Bernie campaign. And the next 650 were actually held by volunteers who we trained by Google Hangout and we talked to on the phone. So anyway, so that's an example of something which you never thought, you know, we'd have to do this in person or the digital people, but it's what worked. And that's such a, you know, th that, that's such a cool reaction that I find works for many things in life, is let's just do that thing that you want to do so we can show that it doesn't work. Um, and then when it works, it's like, okay, now we have other problems. Um, you're, doing, um, you're doing a thing that you hadn't, or you just did do a thing that you hadn't tried before that was also, you know, a little bit like, okay, let's try this crazy thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So, I mean, I was living in Berkeley when we the founder of Adbusters and I came up with the idea for Occupy Wall Street. But after the Occupy movement kind of collapsed, my wife and I moved to rural Oregon. We live in this town called Nehalem with 280 voters. And these, you know, after a while, I was working on my book there, and after a while, the local activists would come up to me and be like, we want to protect our watershed, we want to protect our water quality, we want them to stop clear cutting our forests. And I would say to them, look, the only solution is to take control of your city council. And in Oregon, what's amazing is that elections are usually uncontested, and in fact, sometimes they don't even have enough people to vote, or enough people to run for office. And I found out the reason for this is that there is a network called the Good Old Boys, and once you violate that network, you get a whole bunch of pushback and intensity. So basically, long story short, I ran for mayor, but instead of running for mayor like in the sense of vote for me, and I think this is one of the the ideas that I want to get across is one of my critiques, I think, of the progressive electoral strategy is that it's oriented so, around, so much around charismatic single individuals. But instead of orienting around charismatic single individual named Michael White so I can feel good about myself, instead I said, I'm going to create something called a people's association, and before each city council meeting, we'll get together as many voters who want, and we'll, and we'll talk about what city council should do in the next day's meeting. And if I'm elected mayor, I will just abide, abide by the decisions of, of these citizens. And it was amazing because before I started doing this, one person would show up at city council and sit there and they wouldn't, you know, and leave. But like 20 or 30 percent of all voters ended up coming to at least one of these meetings that I held. It was fantastic. It was amazing. And people and some people really loved it and some people didn't love it. So but <laughs> some people hate it. But but in the end, it was I think it was an amazing experience. And so I ended up getting I lost, sadly, but I ended up getting 20 percent of the vote which is 20 times the Green Party. It's 10 times what DeRay got in urban Baltimore. And to me, this was like a kind of a vindicate. I mean, I'm black. My book has the word revolution in the title. They were calling me all kinds of a Satanist, all kinds of stuff, and still 20% of the vote. So to me, it was a tremendous vindication of this idea that we could go into rural areas, unex unapologetically talk about the revolution, but then talk about revolution in the terms of p giving decision-making power back to our neighbors and to ourselves. Um, so it was beautiful, but it was also very hard. You know, it was very, very hard to... Uh, to kick up all those emotions, so. But in the end, I think it was positive. Let's talk about that for a minute, because I think, you know, you're, um, you're alluding to something that's, you know, that's pretty raw and painful there, which is that when you um, put yourself out there, mm -hmm. um, you know, you had, you had some really unpleasant stuff happen to you mm -hmm. um, that comes from, 
you know, a deep well of problems that the country has with mm. um, things like race. How did you, what did you turn to in your, mm. in your thinking about revolution to get through that? Well, I mean, I think that the thing that's beautiful about revolution is it does follow certain kinds of patterns. And the, the fact of the matter, in my experience as an activist, nothing that I experienced was outside the norm. Whenever you create something, it makes, let me put it this way, effective forms of protest make us extremely uncomfortable. The very idea, like Occupy Wall Street, take Occupy Wall Street, the very idea that people were gonna go down and sleep in the street, like people slept over here, just on the corner in downtown Berkeley, it made both the people who were sleeping there and other people who saw them sleeping there uncomfortable. But once you overcome that, once you see someone losing their fear and doing something, it becomes kind of contagious. So for me, it's like, when I start to be told that I'm doing it incorrectly, or when I start to feel uncomfortable, I actually know that I'm on the right path. It's a, it's a matter of recoding one's experience and, and, and saying, oh boy, I feel, I'm getting a lot of pushback here. I feel very uncomfortable. I must be onto something, you know? So, um, you know, but in the end, I think what, 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 did, what I found, if I could give myself a strategic critique of my own role and what happened there, what I learned is that um, when, you, when you do something like that, you need a very strong base to back you up. So all of the people I presumed to be my allies and friends, when they started hearing negative rumors about me, they didn't step forward and back me up. They, they went and hid, you know? And so that's, I ended, up, I ended up being more upset, not at my opposition who made up completely ridiculous stories about me, but my so-called friends who didn't back me up. And so that's where my thinking is going now is, well, how do you create a base that can withstand the social pressures that will happen when you start to explicitly talk about, no, we are taking over our community and we're gonna do a whole series of beautiful things, you know? And so that I think is, is what I would, where I would critique myself is the, the development of a base that's very strong. One thing that I admire about both of your books is that you are quite self-critical um, in these books and you talk about you know, things that failed um, and you call them things that failed. Um, you have a chapter in the book, Becky, where you talk about um, the incomplete um, conversation about race that happened in the Bernie campaign and what that taught you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I think that, first of all, I just want to acknowledge, Michael, what you said, that the counter-revolution is real, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that, that when you, you know, that when, you, when, you, when you're trying to build a revolution, that the counter-revolution comes in strong, and a lot of the times the counter-revolution comes from your friends, and, and it's good to be prepared for that to happen and to be, to be ready for it. And so on this question, one of the rules that we, that we learned on the Bernie Sanders campaign was that, we, that fighting racism needed to um, be, you know, part of the central message to everybody. Um, and that it wasn't um, something that you only talked about with one, it wasn't a message for one constituency. Um, and, 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 you know, the Bernie Sanders campaign failed to win um, uh, African American and Latino voters who were, you know, over 30, right? And, and, and we, we won with younger voters, but, but we lost in, in big numbers with older voters who, who tended to show up at the polls more. And it, it was pretty massive. And so when you look at that, you have to see that as a, as a central fail in the campaign, no matter what the, what the policy agenda was. And, and, and we realized that even though there were a lot of things that Bernie had done in his life and there were a lot of things that were in the platform, you know, having a personal, you know, commitment and having taken personal actions in ways that are consistent with, with fighting for racial justice, it's not the same as putting racism at the center of the message to everybody and saying we need a multiracial coalition to attack all of these issues, but, but race has got to be part of what we talk, talk with everyone about. And so, and so, you know, Alicia Garza and Ian Haney Lopez to, to, to East Bay Luminary really critiqued the campaign really well and, and I think it, it didn't come out from so much as Zach and I you know having profound thoughts about this but one of the things that we did after the campaign before we wrote the book was um, we said okay what we failed on this front we know we failed we can guess why we failed but let's actually look at what black leaders and intellectuals said about the about the campaign so Ian Haney Lopez, Heather McGee, and, and Alicia Garza said essentially um, that we needed to put racism, fighting racism at the center and talk to white voters as well as black voters about it. Um, we all need to recognize that the billionaires are using um, race to divide us and hold power, um, and that it's our duty to ensure that, um, that we put uh, immigrants, people of color, and working class people of color as part of the leadership circle um, that's making strategic decisions about, about anything that we do. And I think this is an important thing for us to put at the center of the next things we push to do because clearly the coalition that we built was not big enough to win. And if we're gonna win a real majority, um, uh, we have to be part of these, not expecting other people to show up for our fight, but we have to be showing up for these fights in very real ways to attack not just economic inequality, but structural racism. 
And you just came off um, a project that put this into practice um, in certain ways. And you were, you know, we were talking earlier about how uh, you found that the constituents that you were talking to as part of this campaign were way ready for what yeah. you were saying. So I, I don't know if any of you have followed. There was an election a couple weeks ago in Philadelphia where we elected Larry Krasner to be the Democratic nominee for the district attorney of Philadelphia. And, and Philadelphia is the fifth biggest city in the country, and it's the most incarcerated per capita. All right, and so this is, you know, um, uh, the tip of the spear, you know, for incarceration of, of communities at, at mass scale. And, uh, and I've been working with some people from the, from the Bernie campaign and some other uh, longtime social activists um, to get involved. We started a pack called the Real Justice Pack. Um, and this pack was created to go into counties and to help district attorney candidates um, uh, win races who are committed to ending mass incarceration, which, which they're uniquely situated to do. A, a district attorney can unilaterally decide not to charge marijuana possession. They can decide not to ask for cash bail. Um, they can decide not to charge crimes that uh, require mandatory minimums and, and, and charge other charges instead. Um, they can really clear a lot of people uh, out of the jails. And, you know, coming out of the Bernie Sanders campaign, we knew that we needed not just to pay lip service to these issues, but that we needed to actually go um, and work on these issues of ending mass incarceration. Uh, and so that's one of the things, you know, that we're modeling with our work, literally putting our money and our time um, into these district attorney races, working with these multiracial coalitions to end mass incarceration. I think this is a really important first step to changing um, how the coalition that we'll have when we go into federal fights is to be there and help win these races, not just trying to get Democrats to win at this level, but to try and get um, people who want to end mass incarceration uh, and change the facts on the ground for so many of the people um, that are not represented and that have been um, left behind. And, and I will note that there's going to be a district attorney race here in Alameda County in 2018 and challenge people who want to see elections play out differently on a national level to pay attention to these local elections that have a profound impact on the lives of our neighbors. Okay, since we're going there, um, <laughs> let's, let's talk for a moment about this, um, this tendency for people, you know, that people have, have so much pent up energy, especially progressives and there is so much money and energy going into special elections and, you know, the 6th District in Georgia and, you know, Paul Ryan's challenger. And it's all, you know, very um, exciting and sort of has a, has a drama to it. But um, I'm curious um, if you guys think that that's the best use of time and money. Mm. Well, I think that, so I think that one of the lessons of Occupy and Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock and all of these movements is that you can only attain sovereignty through limited avenues now, okay? So it may have been true in the past that people in the streets could manifest a power over their governments and the governments would have to listen. Maybe that's true in the past, but right now it doesn't seem to be true. And so we know that there are only two ways left. You can win elections or you can win wars, okay? Those are the only two ways to actually have a legitimate sovereignty in the end of the day as we see with Donald Trump, okay? So Donald Trump won an election. There's no mechanism in our country to have another rerun, so he's actually the commander-in-chief, blah, blah, blah. And so it seems to me that we, have, we, we know we have to use social protests in order to win elections. We know that. And so, but the challenge is, what form does that take, you know? And again, I think that for me, like where I distinguish myself from progressives is that I think the progressive paradigm, electoral, uh, the typical uh, progressive electoral strategy still hinges on, let's find good people and put them into office. And I'm much more excited by things like the Five Star Movement in Italy. You know, the Five Star Movement in Italy, they call themselves a movement, and yet they are the second or third largest political party. And, and what, what distinguishes them from the idea of finding charismatic single individuals is, first of all, the founders of the party don't run for office, but second of all, and more importantly, they actually give important decisions up to their members. And so I think this is the holy grail. As I'm, what I'm imagining is a social movement that's able to sweep elections, but maintain decision-making power over the people they put into office. So absolutely, I think that this, this, I do think that all energy, basically all energy of activists should be placed onto electoral strategies. But we do need to like, be critical and think about the whole spectrum of what that could look like. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I think we need to get away from trying to find that holy, wonderful Obama or Bernie Sanders or whoever it is, you know, that we can, I mean, these are good people and I like them and I like their policies, but there's something deeper going on here, which is, can we really revive democracy in the sense of giving as many people as possible decision-making power over their lives? I think a social movement can do that. So, 
So in that spirit of, you know, devolving power out, um, we want to make sure to have some room for your questions. Um, and I think we have um, a mechanism for doing that and a lot of people who have questions. Um, so let's start, um, just because I, I saw you first, let's start over on the left. And I, there are only two rules for these questions. Please, no statements. You can come up and make the statement afterward and no two-part questions. And I will repeat the questions if the room can't hear them. Oh, excellent. OK. So um, you with the uh, fabulous scarf in the back. Had to start on the left, you know. Uh, yeah, at, at 18, I managed a campaign for the Green Party in my town when a good old boy was uh, leaving office, and we had a potential opportunity for a third party candidate. Two weeks before the election, without consulting me uh, as campaign manager, he quietly endorsed the Democratic nominee and left office. So from the beginning, I knew that that was probable for Bernie as well. So I was wondering for Becky internally and Micah externally, how do you reflect upon this person who seemingly had strong values, his debates against Hillary were a beautiful spectacle, and then when it comes down to it, he endorses this neoliberal nightmare? Okay, well, so I, so I was a senior advisor for, for, organ, for organizing um, uh, and not for, um, you know, what happened after the primary indoor. So I wasn't, I wasn't in the room. I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't part of that. But here's what I would say is that, you know, it was very clear for those of us who were on the campaign trail every day working with the volunteers and the voters was that people were passionate about the Bernie Sanders campaign because they agreed with his political analysis. And, um, and there was a lot of people who were new to politics and a lot of people who were, had been involved in politics before, but they, were, they, were, they agreed with Bernie's analysis and then they, uh, then they believed that if he was elected to office that he would actually do what he said. Um, and I think it was less about him as a cult of personality, though lots of the memes and the young people really created some hilarious things, you know, with him at the center, um, uh, uh, Bernie at the center. But I, I think that repeating this, like going out there and, and volunteering and voting for a platform um, when there's someone that you believe will actually do it when they're in office um, is the most important thing that we can do. But the way politics is run at the national level, it, it's, it's, it's quite broken where you have choices that you don't like um, and you're trying to avoid the worst outcomes and, and everybody who's involved in political life have to make their decisions. I mean, movements are, are, are quite moral, but, uh, but our electoral politics are, are quite practical and, and we need to find a way to merge them more effectively so that we don't come down to those kind of choices. Um, I want to say something about Donald Trump because I, I always, whenever I talk about Donald Trump, I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, but I, I end up giving kind of underhanded compliments to this person. So I think that, let me tell you, I, was, uh, I did a book signing um, over a year ago, long before Donald Trump was like, even people thought he was going to win. And this person came up to me and she said, I, I disagree with probably a lot of people in this audience. Uh, I'm, I'm a conservative Christian and I'm voting for Donald Trump because he's going to destroy this country. He's going to burn it to the ground. And, and, and she's an apocalyptic Christian conservative. And, and that's why she voted for him. And you know what Donald Trump did that I think is, is, is beautiful is that he would say things like, for example, if I don't get the primary, there's going to be riots in the streets. Now, that's the language of revolution that excites me. And if Bernie Sanders had said that kind of stuff, like, if I don't get the primary, there's going to be riots in the streets. Or if he had said, or after the primary, he had lost the primary and said, OK, we're having town halls across the country to decide what I should do next then I would have been really motivated. But I think it's, it's, this, it's still this idea. What, what unites, in the end of the day, what unites Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, Obama, Clinton, all of them, Elizabeth Warren, they all agree on one thing, which is once they're elected, they shall make the decisions by themselves in their bedroom while brushing their teeth if they want. And I think that that's, that's, the, that's, that's the wrong, that's the wrong way. I think instead what we need are candidates who say, okay, I lost the primary, what should I do? You know, and if his members, if we had said, you should run independent or you should endorse Clinton, then I would have been happy with that decision. But I think that's really ultimately what Bernie Sanders, I was at the DNC and it was just so sad to see him in the audience and endorsing Clinton in the end. So, um, yeah. All right, yeah, exactly. Thank right here you. In the middle. Um, given the history of this country and what has actually improved people's lives in material ways, are we giving up on labor unions entirely? I haven't heard one word about it. And if so, why does, does it need to be reconfigured due to the way labor has changed? Are, you, are we just going to forget about it? <laughs> so, 
Becky has a lot yeah, of so, so I, I'd like to say that there are some amazing labor unions, and I'm going to name one, um, the California Nurses Association and the National Nurses United. And if we, and if the labor unions that are, you know, are headquartered in Washington, D.C., um, acted a lot more like the, the nurses who are headquartered in uh, Oakland, California, then I think we'd see, um, we'd see, a, we'd see a, a stronger labor movement and we'd see labor uh, leading the most important wins for policy fights. But, but you know, if you, if you shift from the federal level to the state level and you look at what's happening with the single, pay, the single payer bill being pushed right now in California, I mean, that, that would not, we would not have passed the Senate with that bill, which could change lives in California and then set a standard for the nation if it wasn't for the leadership of labor and in particular the nurses who have a very particular attitude towards what it means to fight for their patients, which means healing not just the patients but the world. And I think it's that kind of attitude in labor that it would take to have labor actually lead the revolution and lead the resistance. How about um, over here in the pink? Oh, you're way over there. Then you're, you're next after that. How about that? Oh, should I, I go? Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, Micah, I was surprised to hear you say that the Occupy movement was a failure, and I guess it depends on what criteria you use to evaluate it, but it seems to me that at least it provoked a national conversation about equality, or inequality, really, so that in that level it was a um, success, yeah. successful. But I really want to ask both of you about um, whether we should be focusing on trying to impeach Trump, because I just don't see how this world can stand four years. Yeah, let me respond to the first part, because people always kind of bring that up with me. And I, wanna, I just want to say something, which is that um, there is something that has happened to the left where we have lowered our horizon of possibility such that we celebrate failure as if they are success. Let's, let's be real here for a second. Imagine if Lenin and Trotsky had been like, well, we didn't topple the czar, but my gosh, did we really get the language and the discourse differently in this world? You know, I mean, it's a joke. You know, it's a total joke. And I think that what's happened is that on the left, what I was trying to get at with this comment about Trump is that Trump explicitly used insurrectionary revolutionary rhetoric. And, and on the left, we've started to do this game where it's like, we're changing the discourse. It's like, I'm sick of it, okay? So Occupy was a failure to the degree that we did not topple the Obama administration. Let's remember that it was Obama who crushed Occupy and not Trump. Trump didn't even exist in 2011. We did, not, we did not get money out of politics. We did not do all the things that we wanted to do, you know? And so it, 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 good things happened, I understand. It, good things happened, but we did not achieve what revolutionaries for the last 300 years have defined as success, which is the capture of the legal regime and the fundamental transformation about how decisions are made within the government, okay? So that's what success really means, and I think we can attain that. I just want to say that. That's what I wanted to say. I want to just follow up... Um because it ties back to what you were saying earlier about, um, you know, Bernie could have said, you know, there's going to be riots in the street if I don't win, or he could have said, I'll have a nationwide series of town halls to ask what I should do next. Those are two really different things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious. Well, I mean, ultimately, it comes down to your, to your vision of what kind of revolution it's going to be. So I think that, yeah, I'm, I'm, what, what excites me is this idea, I mean, going back to the early days of the Russian Revolution, what they really did is they set up Soviets where basically were general assemblies and they tried to devolve decision-making power down to those things. So what I'm trying to get at is there's different ways to be a revolutionary. Um, I would prefer the town hall method, but I would also, I'm a little bit excited by the other one. And I can get why people would vote for that. I can get why people would say, yeah, I'm going to put Trump into power and he's going to totally destroy America. I don't think at the time they realized that meant to the benefit of Russia, you know, which is sadly where we're at. Um, so... Yeah, I think I do think though that if, if Bernie Sanders had, um, I just can you imagine like Lenin saying, "Okay, we need to vote for the bourgeois parliamentary candidate here." Like, no, he didn't say that kind of stuff. You know. I mean, also, that revolution ended up working out incredibly well. Um. <laughs> well, but this is the thing. This is this gets at exactly at the heart of the left, which is we've given up on the possibility and desirability of revolution. Every time I talk about Lenin or Trotsky, people start telling me they're bad. It's like those are our heroes. If you can't celebrate those people, then who are we supposed to be celebrating? 
Castro, Mao, all these people are flawed individuals and the revolutions were very dirty. But let me tell you something about the American Revolution. Extremely bloody. People went around and killing their neighbors. Let's talk about the French Revolution. They would put people on barges and then drown them in the, in the, in the river. That's what the French Revolution did. So every revolution has these horrible and, and terrible sides to it. But instead of running from revolution, we need to say, okay, that seems to be some aspect of what happens in these moments. How do we mitigate those and decrease those and stop those? Instead of saying, I'm an anti-Lenin, I'm anti-Stalin. I mean, it's like, who are your heroes then? Who are our heroes, really? I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. He's a hero well, so too, but. Let's toss it back to you and see what, uh, you know, we've got a provocation in the room. Okay. Uh, oh, the impeachment. I question. would like to say that Trump did not really win. Cross check, Greg Palast. Democracy at the, at the, the money could buy. Read that, get that DVD from anywhere. But he is president. So she set up the impeachment question for you very well. Well, I think that, you know, okay, this is where I think, look, I think, look, I think, I think it's like this. Unless there is a social movement that's ready and willing to take power in this country, then the toppling of Trump will just put someone who's worse into power. This, this is the experience of the Arab Spring. This is the experience of the Arab Spring. I think that Donald Trump, I think what we're witnessing is a kind of a version of the Arab Spring, and Donald Trump is our Muslim Brotherhood Morrissey. And I think that there's a deep state in this country that will try to convince us to rush into the streets and get rid of him. And that what did the Egyptians get was something far worse than Mubarak or Morrissey. So I think that, I think that if we want to topple Trump or impeach Trump, then we have to be prepared to govern should he fall. Otherwise, it's just some sort of weird game. I don't know. Hi, um, I'm not a native Californian, but I'll bet many of the people in this audience understand the effectiveness of the AIDS movement. And one of the ways that that group of activists created a situation where AIDS drugs were developed and marketed and provided so that hundreds of people, thousands of people lived instead of dying was they learned everything that they could learn about the AIDS virus. They learned about effective treatments. They read the books. They read the research. And then they worked directly with the pharmaceutical industry. Okay, well, how does that relevant for what we're dealing with now? Uh, cent uh, centering our efforts on the people, on the processes, on the institutions that can actually produce change, like electing DAs uh, who will uh, open the prison doors and create a better system of justice. Uh, uh, I don't think, Frank, uh, with respect, I don't think revolution is the way, uh, it, unless we are Mahatma Gandhi, and use his example, or Martin Luther King Jr., rest their souls, but the Soviet rev revolution <laughs> destroyed the lives of millions of people, and look what it led to. Is that really what we want? I don't think so. Okay, so the question is, how can we apply the lessons from that very effective strategy of those early AIDS activists to what we're dealing with in this country now? And we're not just dealing with Trump. That's a great question. Thank you. Let's hear you. Oh, yeah. So, so, so here, here's what I think. Uh, you know, I think we just have to really recognize that all across this country, the state has its boot on the neck of an increasing number of people. It's the state and the corporations. And people are just being crushed into the ground. And they do, they, do not see, they do not see relief, they do not see help, they do not see connection to these institutions that say that they're going to help them. And so something's going to happen, right? It could be violent revolution, it could be political revolution like Bernie asked for and so many people, including people here, here responded to, but something Something has to happen. And it's not just going to be removing Trump from his position, because what's happening to us right now, it's led by the Republicans, um, and not just Trump. And so, so, you know, we can take examples of ACT UP, we can take examples of other successful social movements, um, but we just have to, I think we can't close down this idea that there's going to be some kind of revolution, and it might be the one that we saw Trump at the head of, right, and we're seeing you know, elected officials assaulting journalists. We're seeing all these things that are happening right before us. The country is changing, right, rapidly, devolving. And so, so we, I think we really have to face that anything that we've done before is probably not going to meet the moment because this moment is very different than any moment in the 80s or, or the 60s um, before us. And we have to understand that our problems are really radical 
Our solutions are going to have to be really radical, and we're, we're not going to get out of this by being a little bit better at some of the things that we've done in the past. I, I really, I, having traveled the country and talked to people and seen the pain, you know, I realize that that's true. But I also think that we're at a tipping point because people are so crushed. People are so crushed. And when I was in, I spent like a long time in Philadelphia going door to door talking to people about this district attorney's race, white and black. And, you know, at the doors, we were talking to people, knocking on doors and talking to people about, you know, about mass incarceration. Are we putting too many people in jails? Is the, is the system racist and unfair? You know, and, um, and are the police making people less safe instead of more safe? And, and time and time again, people said yes. And they're ready to respond. So I think we can't underestimate um, the ability for people to embrace radical change at this moment, but we also shouldn't be so um, uh, uh, hopeful to think that it's not going to go very, very wrong if we don't make it go very, very right and, and fast. I think we're already getting, you know, toward the end here, and I'm going to ask festival staff to signal us when it's over, but we have, I, I think we've got a couple more questions we can get in. I, I've also been thinking about Egypt as well and, and thought of the same example, but the lesson there also is I'm scared of that if liberals, mostly affluent middle-class liberals, in order to feel protected, they too, like in e countries like Egypt, will give up on democracy if they can't help work with us to build a viable popular movement. You, you have certain countries in Latin America and in Egypt where they, in order to feel protected, they, they have the, a liberal lifestyle that they need a military to run their society and and I'm a little bit afraid that they might give up on the whole uh, idea. And because there's, there's two different kinds of authoritarianism I kind of see in our country today. One that's kind of bigoted and non-bigoted, but it's still kind of seem going away from democracy and those values. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess I don't, I don't agree with that analysis. I mean, I, so I had lived in Egypt before the revolution, and then I was able to go back over this Christmas, and I met with some people who were part of the Tahrir uprising. And I think the first thing that they told me that I just want to share with you, because it was really quite shocking, is they were saying that the situation has become so bad in Egypt now that many activists have turned to suicide, and they're taking uh, drugs, and even voluntary electroshock therapy, and that it has never been worse to be an activist in Egypt than it is under this current government. So, it's, so what we're talking about here is not some sort of like um, game in our heads. It's a real life and death kind of situation. And I think that when you actually analyze what happened during the Arab Spring, quite frankly, it's that the secular youth and the liberals who helped topple Mubarak were completely unable to put forward a credible person to govern. Only the Muslim Brotherhood put forward a credible person who was willing to govern and did govern for a short time. And that's where I think we are in America, is that we are in the same position of, we like to protest, we like to dream about toppling Trump, we like to talk about revolution and resistance as if we live in some sort of Star Wars movie, but at the end of the day, we have no movement prepared to take over and govern. I don't believe that we do. And so I think that in Egypt, it's not that they wanted the security of, of the military state, it's that they had no other option, and it's that they were used. They were used, just like I think we could become used by, you know, there could be some sort of tape that proves whether it's true or false that, that Trump is working with Russia, and we could see massive street protests emerge in this country calling for his ouster, and there could be no actual progressive or leftist alternative, and therefore we get something worse. That's what happened to Egypt. So I don't think they wanted it, but that's what they got. Hi. Um, Mike, I read your book. It's really interesting. I'm confused about your, your take on, is it theurgism? How do you? Theurgism. Theurgism. So you, you say theurgy frees the rebel to campaign non-linearly, um, to disobey natural laws and to create revolutions that hinge on a miraculous intervention. You, you mentioned a little bit about sunspots. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about this and I'd like to know more. It makes me a little worried. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is, the, this is the, so one of the legacies of the left we all know is a kind of historical materialism, secular materialism, and this kind of thing. So what does theurgy mean? Theurgy is ancient Greek for sorcery. It means God work. Um, it's, as I say in the book, it's kind of esoteric. So I'm not going like, to get into it too much, but I'll give you another example. I gave you the sunspot example. Let me give you another example to help you think about it. In the book, I talk about the origin of Christianity, but I'm going to give you another example, which is, so computer scientists have found out that cosmic rays, cosmic rays are invisible, undetectable by humans, that they can interact with computers. If, they hit, if the cosmic ray hits the computer chip just right, it could crash the computer. We know now that sometimes when your phone crashes, your computer crashes, it's not the software, but instead cosmic rays. Okay, take that fact and add it to another fact, which is there was an election in Europe where a cosmic ray came and it hit the election machine and it gave one of the candidates 4,096 extra votes and he won. All of a sudden though, people were like, wait, 
that's too many votes in our election, we don't have an extra 4,000 votes. And they went back and they figured out cosmic rays messed with this computer. So what I'm saying is there are examples, there's other ways of thinking about social change that are completely out there, you know? And if you look at the origin of Christianity, it ultimately comes down to two people having dreams of Jesus, literally. That's why we have Christianity, is some guy named Constantine had a dream that Jesus visited him during the night, and he also saw some uh, celestial star in the shape of a cross. Maybe that's true or not true, but ultimately the, or the birth of Christianity wasn't street protests, it was dreams. And so th these are examples of other ways of thinking about social revolution. I thought it was the coffee and the keyboard with my computer. Uh, <laughs> so I think we only have literally two more. So I have, I have a question for the model that Becky raised earlier about going around the country and having meetings on the ground. I know that there are some Trump voters who would vote for him even if he shot someone on Fifth Avenue or did whatever crazy thing came into his head. But I think there are a lot that are now very disillusioned and will become more so as they realize that he doesn't stand up for them at all and that there's really much more common ground between Trump voters who are victims of his policies and the rest of us who are victims of his policies. And I'm wondering whether you think there would be any hope for having the types of on-the-ground meetings you talked about, but not just inviting our folks, inviting Trump folks, disillusioned folks, all folks, and saying, we have common ground, we are the people, we need leaders to come out of those meetings, and I'm just wondering if you think that would have any hope of succeeding. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think, you know, yes, I think when you get people together and they actually talk in person, they find out that they, you know, that even if they believe different things, that they find out that they have some common ground and, and people do need to be, they need to be listened to. And one of the things that started since the election is this project called knockeverydoor.org, which is helping people no matter where they live, go out and start knocking on doors and talking to their neighbors about what happened in the election and what should, what should happen going forward just so we can start this process of talking to each other and listening to each other and, and thinking about what we what we want for the, for the future. But, but here I'll just say this, is that if we don't have an alternative to put forward, this gets back to what Mike was talking about, if there's not an alternative that someone can vote for, people are gonna keep voting for change even if it's like change for the worse. And so I think we have to realize, and, and part of this is this, this, this growing critique of, of neoliberalism, you know, that we don't want a system with a few more winners and a few less losers. That's what the Democrats have been offering largely at a national level, is that we actually really need to take on um, uh, the, the devastating impacts of financialized capitalism and, and deal in a real way with, with structural racism. And I think people in communities, if we got together and that's what we wanted to talk about, and that there was actually a credible plan to make a change, that people, you know, getting people together, you know, absolutely, you know, w would actually lead to some solutions, but it's not going to be some kind of kumbaya unity. Civil discourse is not going to get us there, right? Unless we put forward, um, you know, real alternatives. And, and one of the places I look for alternatives these days is, is the younger millennials. Um, these millennials who are under 27 years old, they came of age during the financial crisis. Many of them saw the, their parents lose their homes and, and the banks get, um, get bailed out. Many of them ended up headed to community college instead of a four-year college or, or not to college at all. And they're really radical. And, um, and they read books and they're really team-oriented and they're digitally native. And you know, if we can actually, I think, put some of these young people to the front, um, uh, and we can sort of like let the rest of us follow their lead. I think they have a lot more hope in bringing things together, um, including uniting what um, what unites the Trump supporters um, with um, with the traditional Democratic base. Um, and so, so maybe we should have those meetings, but we should make sure that they're they're led by community college students. <laughs> You have the last question, so make it count. Um, well, it's, it's a variant on the question that was just asked, is if we do need to put forward this, this strong vision um, and this strong alternative, but at the same time, there is a deep need for healing in this country, do you think that that's, I guess, how do you see activists playing into that? Do you think activists can do both? Do you think that activists need to be squarely on the, uh, task of putting forward an alternative while somebody else holds a middle. Um, it, those are two things that deeply concern me and I'm curious your thoughts on them. Um, you know, I just, again, this is good. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna say, look, I disagree a little bit, okay? I think, yes, I know. For, for, for me, you know, the left, one of the things about the left is that we, we are so rational and we're so obsessed with this idea that once we have the correct, like, 10-point platform, everyone will read it, they'll be completely convinced, and we shall win. 
I think that that, I love that idea because I'm, I'm from the left as well. But for me, I think that people join social movements because of how it makes them feel. And this is why we have this weird paradox where people interview occupiers or whatever and it's like, they don't even know why they're there. And it's like, and, and the left or the activists like to say, no, it's not true, they do know, they do know. But I think that partly, partly why they're there is because of how it makes them feel to be part of it. And this is why people voted for Trump, ultimately because of how it made them feel. That's the story I was trying to tell about the conservative Christian, is that she voted for Trump because of how it made her feel. So I think that in, if I were an actor, and this maybe gets to the healing part you're talking about, but I think that if I were, if I were to, to, to give advice on this question, I would say people joined Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring and Black Lives Matter and voted for Trump because it made them lose their fear. It, made them, it gave them a feeling they liked. And so it's not about policies and 10-point plans. It's about how you feel joining that movement. And I think that a lot of people don't feel comfortable joining that pointy-headed, rational movement, even though it makes me feel comfortable because I love to know all about the ideas and stuff. I think it's instead this deeper question of like, how does it feel to be part of our movements? You know, I think sometimes it feels a lot better to be part of the Trump movement than it does our movements, so. Well, and I'm gonna disagree for a different reason, which is I, I, I hear a lot about healing, right? And, and I think actually we need to fix the stuff that's really broken. So um, instead of this idea that we need to feel better together. Right, and I think that you know a lot of people on the left, we believe in different things, um, that there's no unified left, and this idea of healing and being able to get along is not as important as defining what faction that we're in and um, what formation that we're in, and then you know when the formations align and we want to fight for something great, but otherwise, you know, I'd much rather see us fix you know, health care and make sure that everyone in this country can go to the doctor than for us to feel like we can you know, not fight in, in a room based on wounds that we perceive from the primary. What a great note to end on. Thank you both so much. And you all know that you need these books in your lives. So come out in the back where you can buy them and you can have Micah and Becky sign them, um, sign them for your mother-in-law, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, and if you want to subscribe to Mother Jones, you know what to do as well. Thank you so much for coming and have a great rest of the festival. Thanks.